Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily, I'm Lauren Izzo. And coming up in this edition. Could we be close to a cure? Israeli researchers say a new drug may be up to 95% effective in eradicating COVID. The Hague rules that it can investigate Israel and Hamas for war crimes, but the Prime Minister says it's anti-Semitic. And Syrian media reports on a Russian military mission to bring back missing IDF soldiers. Israelis are getting restless as they tire of lockdowns. Now, more than a month into the country's third nationwide closure, the government has voted to ease restrictions and depend almost fully on its world-leading vaccine campaign that continues to surpass expectations. More in the next report. At 7 o'clock this morning, Israel began to ease lockdown restrictions. On Friday, the government announced citizens would no longer have to remain within a one-kilometer radius from their homes. Also, one-on-one -on -one treatments like beauty services are permitted to reopen after more than a month-long closure. Still, malls and stores that receive customers will stay shut. The Nature and Parks Authority also announcing Friday morning that from Sunday, nature reserves and national parks that are free of charge will be open to the public. As of today, 3.4 million Israelis have been vaccinated and 2 million have had both doses. <laughs> On Thursday, Palestinians received 10,000 doses of Russia's Sputnik vaccine, officials said, after receiving 2,000 Moderna vaccine doses from Israel. Uh, an unspecified shipment of vaccines from China will also be arriving in Ramallah, and a batch of around 37,000 doses from the COVAX Global Vaccine Sharing Program is expected later this month. There have been nearly 2,000 COVID-related deaths in the West Bank and Gaza. <laughs> Meanwhile, on Saturday, Israel's health ministry recorded 2,624 new cases. There are 1,110 in serious condition, with 302 on ventilators, and the death toll is 5,074, with 57 deaths just over the weekend. Hannah Rifkin, ILTV. As the world races to manufacture and import COVID-19 vaccines, an Israeli hospital say they may have actually found a cure. Researchers at Tel Aviv's Ichilov Hospital announcing over the weekend that preliminary drug trials have seen overwhelmingly positive results. Of the 30 patients that were given the drug, 29 showed improvement within two days and were released from the hospital within three to five days later. Professor Nadir Arbor says the treatment has a 95% positive result and that it is inexpensive and effective. Let's go live to Ikhlov where Dr. Arbor is standing by. Thank you so much for joining us. It is a pleasure and honor to, to be with you. I'm at your service. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, as we've heard, this drug that you're developing is 95% effective. How did you discover that it could work against COVID? I think it too, everyone has to be modest, especially physicians. And you know, this was a phase one trial, which his main purpose is safety. And I'm very happy to say that it's 100% safe. We gave it in a very high dose, and I already asked to increase the dose to approval of the Ministry of Health, and I predict that there is not going to be any toxicity whatsoever. At the same time, it was very pleasant experience to hear the patient telling us that they are feeling much better after they are sev were severe patients with the COVID-19 infection, which heavily breathing, low saturations of uh, oxygen saturations in the blood, very weak. And they said all of a sudden they starting to come back to life. So this was very encouraging and helping us. At the same time, like I said, 
Now the primary aim was safety, and now we, should, we have already asked the Israeli Minister of Health to approve us the next step in order to compare our drug with placebo, also to make sure that efficacy is indeed effective which you know, I have a lot of experience in clinical trials, and always when you look for efficacy, you have to compare it to placebo. The first uh, phase of the trial is finished now. I wonder when the next phases of, of the trial are going to be and when you think this drug might be available uh, to the general public who has COVID. <clears throat> so next stage is I have two aims. One, to increase the dosage even further. 10 to the 10th. It's very high dose. I'm sure we are not going to reach the MTD, maximal toxicity dose. And although the 10 to the 9th was effective, we also, when we think about other indications, maybe more severe patients, maybe we are going to need or higher dose is going to be beneficial. So this is the first aim. The second aim is to compare it with placebo. Like I said, this was a phase one, primary and is safety. In order to really have a feel of the efficacy, you have to compare it to placebo. Right. And that's what I asked to do in the next stage. All right, well, who it's knows? It's going to be, an also, again. Yeah. Yes, but you know, what is a big advantage of this drug? It can be produced easily, efficiently, and at a low cost. Well, so, you know, within two months, I can supply the entire world needs. Well, it's you know what? Easy to We're all really hopeful that this might be the drug that's going to bring us out of this pandemic. Dr. Arbor, thank you so much and best of luck with your future trials. Thank you very much. Thank to you. In a landmark ruling, the International Criminal Court determined that The Hague has jurisdiction to open a criminal investigation against Israel and the Palestinians for war crimes. The investigation into those possible crimes that have taken place in the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem will focus on the 2014 Israel-Gaza war, among other events. While Palestinians are praising the decision, Israel's Prime Minister had a slightly stronger reaction. Hanna Rifkin reports. Palestinians are celebrating victory over the International Criminal Court's ruling it had jurisdiction over Israel and the Palestinian territories, a decision which Israel condemns as anti-Semitic and political. Israel uh, has been always uh, being treated above the law. Uh, there is no accountability uh, when it comes to, to Israel. Now, uh, uh, no one, uh, including the United States of America, could really provide protection to Israel. You know that always when we go to the Security Council, uh, the United States of America is the one who really shields uh, Israel from any criticism and prevents us from getting uh, whatever uh, sanctions uh, needed uh, against Israel. Uh, today, the uh, United States of America cannot do anything you know, to protect Israel, and as a result, Israel has to be treated as a, a war criminal. A pre-trial chamber of three judges at the International Criminal Court over the weekend found the court had jurisdiction over war crimes committed in the Palestinian territories, paving the way for a possible criminal investigation, despite Israeli objections. It's a shame that an international institution that we had so much hope for has capitulated to political pressure. There's no legal basis whatsoever in today's decision, and it damages the faith in the international legal system. Today's decision won't change the reality and won't change history. There isn't a Palestinian state and there never has existed a Palestinian state. Prime Minister Netanyahu calling the move anti-Semitic. When the ICC investigates Israel for fake war crimes, this is pure anti-Semitism. The court established to prevent atrocities like the Nazi Holocaust against the Jewish people is now targeting the one state of the Jewish people. First, it outrageously claims that when Jews live in our homeland, this is a war crime. The U.S. also expressing serious concerns over the move, saying the State Department was reviewing the decision. Hanna Rifkin, ILTV. All right, let's get the legal perspective on this story and go live to Yifa Siegel, a lawyer on the Israeli-American Council. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. I am the uh, chair of the International Legal Forum, the ILF. Sorry, excuse me. Okay, let's begin. Uh, first of all, what exactly does this ruling mean and what will this investigation be focusing on? So this ruling means basically uh, they had to decide whether the court, the ICC, has jurisdiction over this, what the, what's called the situation in Palestine. So to have jurisdiction, it means that a alleged crime needs to happen 
in the territory of, of a state that is a member of the of the of the treaty of the Rome Treaty, and therefore there is reason to believe that alleged crimes were committed and an investigation should be launched. And so this was a preliminary legal question. So in, in this context, the question is: Is there a Palestinian state? Because it has to be a state in order to apply to those standards. And second, where is the territory of that state, uh, uh, in, so that we can determine if the alleged crimes happen on that territory? So that was the the the, the, the decision in front of the, of the court in this particular matter. So assuming this investigation continues, um, if any government leaders, Israelis or Palestinians, are convicted, what can the ICC really do on the ground? Well, it's a very good question. I mean, the ICC, with all due respect, I mean, it's been active for uh, over a decade. It's only uh, convicted mainly African leaders, many times where people did not comply. I mean, there were several cases where arrest warrants or even judgments were handed and no one really respected them. And there was a recent, a very, very recent case of that. So, but we don't want to be that type of state. We don't want to be the type of state that needs to kind of, you know, run away from the ICC or run away from different member states that might or may not decide to enforce arrest warrants. So I think, you know, the this decision for us, it, it, it's a very, very bad decision for Israel's position, I think, in the international community. Um, although, uh, you know, amazing things have happened. I mean, even states like Germany and Austria and Canada and Australia and Uganda and, and other states have stood up, you know, against this decision of, of the ICC, basically stood up and, and argued in front of the court that it should not have jurisdiction because this is not something that the court can, can assert jurisdiction over uh, uh, based on those two questions that I've that I pointed out. So there's, there's this weird situation where it seems like there's, there's a, a vast objection to the premise of the court that they, it can investigate, that there is a Palestinian uh, state, and even that there were war crimes to an extent that should be investigated by the court. And yet we still see a politically driven decision. Okay, well, speaking of politics, um, the United States has said they're extremely concerned about this decision. I wonder if there's anything they can do to change it, and can Israel appeal this decision? Well, Israel can can technically appeal this decision. However, I mean, there was a strategic decision that was made, that, that was taken by the state of Israel, that we do not acknowledge the authority and the jurisdiction of the court over Israelis and over the state of Israel. So uh, this was the reason that the state of Israel has chosen to not participate, and even until this very moment, in any of the proceedings, uh, in any stages of the uh, preliminary investigation. So I would assume, I think it's best to, to, to safe to say that Israel will con the state of Israel will continue to, to, to not recognize uh, the jurisdiction and authority of the court and will not participate, therefore will not appeal. And that means that there's no one else. I mean, the state of Palestine uh, uh, can potentially appeal, though, you know, I think this is one of the greatest absurds because you see, you know, the, they name Israel, Israeli authorities, they name the IDF, and they name Hamas and other militant groups, but they do not name the PA, and they do not name Mahmoud Abbas, and they do not name any of those other officials that are responsible for murder and incitement. So there's a whole preposterous situation. And when it comes to the United States, Look, the, the United States is, is, is at more or less like under, in a similar circumstances. The Americans are also not members of the Rome Treaty. They did not concede to the authority and, uh, uh, of the courts, and yet they are under investigation for alleged war crimes in Afghanistan. Having said all that, I mean, the U.S. is not Israel. It's a stronger state. It has a lot more power in the international uh, uh, arena, and they have their own battles uh, right. to fight now. Obviously, we've also seen a change in, in the way that the new administration is kind of dealing, uh, you know, less aggressively, let's say, with, with, with issues of the ICC. And uh, so, I, I mean, I'm sure that they can pull weight and convince other states to support one thing or another, but not directly. All right. Well, we'll have to wait and see how this develops. Ifa Seagal, thank you so much for this. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Another sign of American support for Israel, the U.S. Senate has voted to keep the United States Embassy in Jerusalem with only three senators voting against it. The vote coming after the Trump administration recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital in late 2017, moving their embassy from Tel Aviv to the holy city of Jerusalem. 
While the Biden administration takes a more balanced position between Israel and the Palestinians, President Biden says that he does not plan on moving the embassy back to Tel Aviv. The planning process is expected to take at least two years, with total cost of construction estimating $600 million. Well, thousands from across the country gathered over the weekend in the northern Arab-Israeli town of Tamra. They were protesting against violent crime and inadequate law enforcement in Arab communities in the aftermath of a fatal shootout this week between police officers and local criminals in which an innocent bystander was killed. Ahmad Hejazi, a 22-year-old nursing student, was shot by police during a gun battle between officers and suspected criminals. Organizers of the demonstration say the gathering was meant to send a message, no to violence and no to crime. Route 70 near Tamra was blocked during the demonstration, while some 10,000 people took part. The Russian military is attempting to locate the remains of two Israeli soldiers missing since 1982. According to Syrian media, soldiers began searches over the weekend in a cemetery near a Palestinian refugee camp outside Damascus. Tzvi Feldman and Yehuda Katz went missing in the 1982 Lebanon War, along with Zachary Baumel, whose remains were recovered and returned to Israel back in 2019. The cemetery designated a closed military zone to Russian forces as they conducted the search operations. While Feldman and Katz were generally believed to have been killed in battle, there's also been speculation and reports that they were captured by the Syrian military and brought to Damascus. So far, the IDF has not commented on the incident. The French president has offered himself as a broker for a new nuclear deal with Iran, and he wants Israel to have a say too. Since Joe Biden took over the White House, experts have expected his administration to re-enter the GCPOA, which Trump dropped in 2018. Now, with new demands from Washington and Tehran, the deal is not being brought back just yet, and France's President Macron says Israel and Saudi Arabia should be consulted as well. And we have, we have to address the stability of the region. And this comprehensive agenda is to be negotiated now because this is the right timing. And we have to find a way to involve in this discussion Saudi Arabia and Israel because they are some of the key partners of the region directly interested by the outcomes with our other friends of the region, obviously. But this is impossible to fix the situation without being sure that all these countries are comfortable with uh, um, with this new agenda, but I will, I will do support in your re-engagement of the negotiation. This is just what I wanted to add. Soon you'll be seeing Tesla electric cars on Israel's streets as they are officially available for purchase and at relatively affordable prices. Israelis can check out the merchandise and take vehicles for test drives at the company's two showrooms in Ramat Aviv and Petah Tikva. Customers already jamming up Tesla's online store, indicating that the first consignment of cars could be well on its way to selling out. Ultimately, if Tesla is successful in Israel, it could transform the local electric car industry. The cars start at just under 180,000 shekels, and yes, that is affordable for a Tesla. Okay, moving on. The Academy Award goes to two Israelis, a professor of engineering from Tel Aviv University, Professor Meir Feder, and his former student. The Academy Award for Scientific and Technical Achievement went to the team behind the Amimon chipset. Dr. Feder is here to talk about his great achievement, but first, here's a part of his acceptance speech. I must say that this is a very exciting day for me. Honestly, I never imagined that I'll be awarded an Oscar. I'm a scientist working on information theory. I expected uh, prizes like the Turing Award, maybe the Shannon Award, and I did get quite a few professional awards, but Oscar, hey. Okay, so I understand this was very unexpected. Why don't you start by uh, telling us about the technology that won you this award? Okay, the technology we developed um, in Amimon is, um, a, I would say, the best way to transfer video wirelessly. Uh, we transfer the video uh, in its top quality and uh, with no delay, that's very important for many industries, and with full robustness. The link is stable and it never falls. Uh, as all of us experienced when, you, when we transfer video over Wi-Fi, let's say, there are many problems. The quality reduces, there is some delays, 
and the, sometimes the link goes up and down, we were able to build a video transmission technique uh, based rooted in a, a fundamental a scientific um, a principles that enabled all those properties that I just mentioned. And this technology uh, was incorporated into movie cameras. And uh, it was incorporated there because uh, they want the quality, the no latency, the no delay, and the robustness of the link. And they use it now uh, for any, any film, any movie that uh, is now being uh, pictured, um, almost any, uh, they use it with the new uh, movie cameras uh, on the set, and it gives them a lot of advantages. All right, uh, so if I just mention... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> if I just mention two of them, one advantage is the fact that it becomes so convenient to set the set so that uh, it saves a, a lot of time on the movie set, and, and that costs a lot of money. Uh, they can now, in, a, in, a, in, in one day, they can uh, film um, and uh, maybe twice as much as they used to be with the old cameras. And the other thing is that it provided a creativity for the director. Now that the camera can move anywhere, uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, the director can see in real time many, movie, many cameras on the set, he can control them and he can play with that and it can make the movies much better. And this is our uh, contribution to this industry. So I understand that the technology is used all across Hollywood. Uh, I wonder if you were ever able yes. to visit a set for a movie that your technology was being used on. Did you ever get to go to Hollywood? Uh, uh, I actually didn't. Uh, I, I am the, uh, the scientist, the engineer, the... Um, uh, I, but people from our companies, uh, from our company that uh, uh, were responsible for selling uh, uh, our technology uh, to the movie cameras, of course, they talked with the director, they visited the set, and uh, they were really able to tell us uh, how, uh, how much we contributed to the, uh, to the industry. Now, uh, you mentioned before that it was two of us, but actually it was four of us. It was me, it was a, a Tzvi Resnik, who, who used to be my former PhD student, and additional two engineers from Amimon, Guy Dorman, who is the head of the algorithm group, and Ron Yogev, uh, who is the uh, VP of R&D of Amimon. And, all, and of course, there was a big team behind them that developed the chips and developed the technology. And uh, it's great to see that we can influence uh, such an important industry well, and get an Oscar. Congratulations to all of you. And I hope this is uh, only your first of many Oscars. Thank you so much for being with us today. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Now it's time for the weather. Here is Hannah Rifkin with the forecast. All right, Lauren. Now this week starting off with some warmer weather. And we're expecting partly cloudy to clear skies for tonight and tomorrow. Now lows tonight will average 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius and tomorrow's highs will average at a pleasant and sunny 74 degrees Fahrenheit or 23 degrees Celsius. Back to you, Lauren. Thank you, Hana. And now just before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. All right, it looks like he got a gift. Opening up the box, what's inside? Oh my god! You, oh my god! You're ready! You're ready! That is definitely the best gift any kid could ever ask for. Oh, it's so cute. My puppy was once that small and that cute. <laughs> <laughs> so adorable. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.29 shekels to the American dollar and 2.58 shekels to the Canadian dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Then don't forget to visit the all new and improved ILTV website at ILTV.tv and let us know what you think. Subscribe to our newsletter for the latest updates while you're there. I'm Lauren Izo. Thank you for watching.